Hello, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at Vita. We would like to remind you that the Q&A feature is available, so feel free to send in your questions for our speakers throughout the discussion. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator who joins us from WTF Health, Jessica DeMassa. Hey everybody, good to see you. I uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Again, I'm Jess Damasa, and we are gonna have a great discussion today about primary care and virtual chronic care. So this virtual chronic care space is more or less emerging. These are all of those cool digital health, health tech, remote patient monitoring, virtual care type businesses like Vita Health that are emerging in this space to help take care of a growing population of chronically ill Americans. So, I mean, we all know that CDC statistic, right? The one that says six in 10 Americans have one chronic condition, four in 10 have two or more. Well, this is putting a lot of strain on the primary care system, which wasn't necessarily built for a population of people that are that ill and that are suffering with those types of diseases that require a lot of longitudinal day-to-day -day care. So today we are going to dive into a conversation about how this virtual chronic care space is emerging to help offset some of that burden on the primary care system and whether or not the primary care system is really that excited about seeing some of these new entrants in the market and some of the models that are emerging that can hopefully blend these two things together so that we can provide better care to everybody. So here to get us smart on this conversation and, and talk through some of the issues around it is our panel of experts. So please join me in welcoming them. From Vita Health, we have their chief medical officer, Dr. Patrick Carroll. Also from Vita Health, we have Gretchen Zimmerman. She is their head of cardiometabolic care. From 98.6, rep in that primary care side, we have Dr. Brad Youngren. He's their chief medical officer. And last but not least, we have Tej Shaw. He is the managing director at Healthscape Advisors, which is a management consulting firm that works with providers and health plans. So welcome, everybody. It's good to have you here. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Gretchen, for saying hello. <laughs> All right. Let's warm up the audience, too. And I want to remind them, as we heard on the intro, you guys are welcome to submit your questions. And the way we're going to do this with the questions is we like to take them throughout. So if you have any questions about what we're talking about while we're talking about it, hit that Q&A button and submit it to us. We'll have our eye on those. If we don't get to them, we'll round them out at the end or someone will email you afterwards. OK, but don't forget to submit your questions as we're going through. All right. Let's kick this off, you guys. I'm really excited to dive into this because, like I said, I think this space is starting to emerge and we're finding a place to put all of these digital health virtual care solutions that manage chronic care. But before we get to that, I really want to level set by talking a little bit about what's changed in primary care. And our intros of our panelists were kind of short because they're going to introduce themselves as we kind of go through. And I want to start with our primary care docs and hear about how primary care has been evolving over, over this period of time of the last like 20, 30 years. So Pat, I want to kick things off with you. I mean, I know you've got a really interesting primary care background, you know, and as we're looking at primary care and how it's really been the cornerstone of the US health system for for quite some time now, I'm curious to hear how you have seen this space evolve over the last period of time. I mean, tell us too uh, how quickly you 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 think it has evolved and where we're at now, particularly as so many Americans are presenting with different types of chronic conditions. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. So my background is uh, I'm the embodiment of the evolution of uh, primary care. Uh, you know, I started uh, over 33 years ago as a family physician and did the typical role of a family physician. I saw folks from nursery to nursing home, 30 patients per day, a panel of 3,000 patients, um, eight to five appointments. Please don't call me on after hours or on weekends. Um, although you know, we had call systems and of course we served those patients. We rounded on folks in the hospital and then saw them at the end of the day to discharge them from the hospital. And so um, it, it, it's a challenging job even back then. I would say it's almost an impossible job today. And why is that? We see the increasing incidence of chronic conditions. You know, as you get a panel of two to 3,000 patients, you have to see patients every 15 minutes. Patients are very complex. And uh, it's just a very, very demanding uh, position. And I, I would say the biggest challenge I see is access. You know, we're facing a shortage of 50,000 primary care physicians in the next five years. And 
our panels are growing, the burden of illness is growing, and there's just not enough time to manage um, and to take care of patients in the way that we need to. So it's, it's, it's a huge problem in terms of access and delivering quality of care in the traditional model. We have to look at different models. So that, that's my intro to this. Okay. All right, Brad, jump in here. Tell us what's going on. I mean, how has the role of the primary care physician been evolving? And what are you seeing today over there at 98.6? Thanks, Jessica. It's nice to be here. Uh, uh, you know, an emergency physician by background, although I've spent the last 15 or so years primarily in the, in the digital health space. So uh, similar to Pat, but probably from a different angle, I sort of saw many of the uh, holes in the primary care system. A lot of what we did in emergency medicine was sometimes treating emergencies, sometimes filling gaps in the care model. Um, if someone came in as an example with hypertension late at night, um, that's mostly a care gap. That's not necessarily an, uh, an emergency per se, and that's a, a significant increase to cost of care. So that motivated me to get involved in the digital health care. As, as Pat said, you know, the, the shortage is really the primary function, the problem that pre-existed the pandemic that we were focused on at 90.6, trying to address that by leveraging technology to expand the reach of primary care physicians. But I think there's two other factors that are in play. One is the impact of the pandemic certainly has accelerated retirements. Um, uh, what we talked about as being burnout that's now being also referred to as moral injury in the medical profession around physicians not feeling like they have the capability to do the right thing for patients due to whatever variety of impacts of access or um, so that's a, another impact that that seems to be ongoing and then i think the other component traditionally has been the the initial wave of technology that healthcare providers were uh, forced to use actually had a negative impact on productivity and a negative impact on provider or physician satisfaction and that was way underestimated on the impact and we're feeling that impact quite significantly now in the market space. And I think that's why we've seen such a large move in the digital healthcare space to come in and support healthcare providers to make their experience better. So we're not only looking at the patient experience, but we're also looking at the provider experience broadly. All right, Gretchen, I want to add, bring you into the conversation here. And I want to hear a little bit about, you know, as we're talking about, we're hearing about how primary care is evolving, you know, it, it's starting to reveal some cracks in the model. And I think both Brad and Pat got into a, a couple of them, but I'm curious to hear from your perspective. I mean, you're somebody who's focused on cardiometabolic care. So as, as people are, mm -hmm. you know, the American patient, the typical American patient now is somebody who presents with a chronic condition. I mean, six out of 10 have one. So, I mean, what right. are you seeing as some of the cracks in the traditional primary care model? Yeah, happy to talk about that. Um, first, I'm a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. And I have been in the field for over a decade now. And I used to work in inpatient settings and outpatient settings. Um, for me, I, you know, I joined Vita eight years ago. And so right at the very beginning when we were a digital health coaching company. Um, but for me, the driving factor was really just a frustration with um you know, frequent readmissions, people being discharged, being given educations when they're very sick and they're not ready re to receive that information. Um, and then even in the outpatient setting, seeing people, you know, regress to their baseline. Uh, I worked a lot in bariatric surgery and just kind of realizing that, you know, the system itself being a reactive system and not really tackling, which I'm going to talk about mental health, which is a huge piece of all of this um, and behavioral change was the problem. And so that's why I, I joined VITA initially. Um, but yeah, for me, me, when we think about the typical American patient and how's that, how that has changed, um, I think what is most obvious to all of us is the rate of depression and anxiety that has increased especially during the COVID pandemic. Um, but we also, because we're seeing an increase in chronic conditions like diabetes, we also need to acknowledge that uh, two out of three patients who have diabetes also have a co-occurring mental health condition like depression or anxiety. And so the problem is, is as, as our, our, our physicians have been talking about here, is when you have a very complex patient like that and they come into a PCP's office and they have 15 minutes, as Dr. Cowell said, you, there's no way you can be, begin to tackle all of the, uh, the, the conditions that are surrounding this patient, um, let alone even, you know, getting into the behavioral change aspect. And um, majority of physicians are prescribing medication, but I know for mental health, for example, um, but I know that it's a frustration of theirs that they can't always get that behavioral change aspect tackle, tackled as well. Um, so I think for me, that's, that's kind of one of the biggest evolutions in our patients. And then also recognizing all of these determinants, social determinants of health and things that impact 
outcomes, clinical outcomes, quality of life, and you know all of those factors. And so our needs have really grown and have changed. Um, and at Vita, you know, I can just say over the last eight years, we've really been able to pivot um, to deliver the care in, in the way that um, it, you know it needs to be delivered to kind of meet all these different factors. Right, Thage, what would you add to that? I mean, you're in a really unique position in, in especially for this conversation. So I'm curious to hear what you would what, what you would add in terms of what you're either seeing or hearing from your client base about what some of the cracks are in that PCP model. And maybe even to add a little bit about where it's holding up. Like what do they what where are they seeing where it's working out and where are we seeing a little bit of a a little bit of a gap? Yeah. Thanks, Justin, and thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I, I love everything that my co-panelists just uh, really set a really nice foundation of this conversation on. So maybe to build on that, maybe just taking a step backwards and starting with some of the positives, uh, you know, we're seeing now really interesting and effective models of primary care, right? When you look at companies uh, like Iora or One Medical, Premise, Agilon, there's dozens of others that are bringing advanced primary care models that really allow primary care to operate uh, in a true care team, including things like Gretchen was just describing around behavioral health and addressing those priorities, uh, as opposed to the, kind of the, the traditional solo practitioner model, right? Really allowing everyone to operate, as we always talk about, at the top, at the top of their license. And you see some real outcomes that are effective, right? 10 and 20% ranges of savings relative to those that are unmanaged or, or in traditional settings. And so those are great, right? And we're seeing more of our clients really look to those opportunities to work with their local providers to create those types of models. The cracks, however, are, are real, right? The reality is while those solutions, I think really bring interesting, effective models of care, they, they really only cover a sliver of the population, right? And by definition, those models can't scale to truly bring, if we're bringing kind of a public health view or a full population view, they can't be the solution in entirety, right? And so I think a big reason why we're here today is to think through you know how it is that the traditional primary care system needs to work in an integrated way in an integrated way with you know companies like 98.6 and Vita and others to kind of expand and extend what they're able to do in their setting with organizations that allow them to, to really just broaden their reach right and I think that that's what I'm excited about talking about here uh, over the next hour. Pat, Brad, either one of you want to add anything about cracks in the model? I mean, I think you guys did a great job of kind of laying out how the space has evolved, but I'm, on that specific point, cracks in the model are places where you think it's holding up. Pat, maybe if you want to add anything there? Yeah, um, definitely a need for a new model of care, particularly with chronic conditions. Um, as a family physician, I became overwhelmed with the fact that, you know, patients of mine needed more intensive glucose monitoring. They needed a, a dietitian, a nutritionist to intervene. Uh, they needed mental health support and counseling. And I could not do it all. I didn't have the time or bandwidth uh, to do that. And so it's, we're really switching to a team-based approach. And quite honestly, we need uh, virtual care for a lot of that acute episodic care uh, to make that entire system work a lot more efficiently than it is today. Brad, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think that one thing I've learned over the last six years in 98.6 is that the care delivery side is, is, is at the center, but when you get into taking care of um, millions of patients and you're trying to do the right thing for them, uh, the notion around how you care coordinate patients um, becomes a critical part of success. And so that, and there are gaps across any aspect of the US healthcare system you could point to um, you know, when you're taking care of patients on direct consumer side and also through health plans, there's a variety of options and sometimes non options in terms of getting patients the right care at the right time. And, and I agree with Pat around the notion that broadening the care team is certainly an area of opportunity and, and uh, an area of some positive change we've seen over the last five years, or not necessarily the physician needs to even be involved, nor would necessarily bring the best outcome for the patient, especially the polychronic patient in those examples. All right, Brad, I want to stay with you on that because, you know, this is where this whole virtual chronic care space kind of comes into play for me. So it's like we've seen a lot of new entrants. I mean, within the last like 10, 15 years through that period of time of these digital health, virtual care, remote patient monitoring type companies, health tech based like Avita Health, you know, who, who kind of come into this space. And I'm curious to hear, you know, what the primary care providers think about these new standalone virtual 
actual chronic care companies? I mean, are they looking at them as interlopers potentially in their relationships with their patients? Are they looking at them as like much needed relief and help? I mean, talk to us a little bit about what you're hearing. Well, I think at the highest level, um, our physicians um, and physicians and many other digital health companies are excited for change. Like, like Pat said, I think he exemplified it perfectly, which is the physician workforce and just the provider workforce in general is ready for a change in care model, something that increases access and everyone's recognizing what isn't working and what hasn't been working. So, and, and many um, healthcare providers are looking for opportunities and options to impact that more broadly speaking. So I don't think, I don't think most healthcare providers are looking at anything that's going on as being uh, a disruption. I, I think it's kind of hard to disrupt healthcare, it's just too big, but changes in healthcare, small incremental changes, uh, I think that the healthcare provider workforce is very excited to see most of the people who come and interview at 90.6 are looking to be participate in change and recognize that change is necessary. Whether that's, I, I think there's all obvious caveats to that, which is everyone wants integrated models. Uh, people, you know, the first sort of wave of telemedicine really lived outside the box, meaning that the, the healthcare provider record had no access to that data. They didn't know what happened. They didn't even know that their panel patient went and saw a telemedicine provider at two in the morning. So even some of those base uh, opportunities to increase transparency and data integration are quite important for the traditional healthcare community to accept uh, a lot of what's going on in the digital healthcare space. Pat, what are you getting from the primary care practices that Vita is working with or approaching? I mean, how are they viewing the help that Vita Health could potentially bring to them or other solutions that are similar to yours? I mean, are you guys looked at as like, you know, get out of my sandbox or is it like, please come in, here's a shovel? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great question. And so, you know, we've gone into prescribing uh, for a particular reason is that we manage a lot of folks who have uh, diabetes that is complex. And if you look at the entire patient population with diabetes, that's over, you know, 35 million, 70% are lower complexity, but it's just 30% that are high complexity and drive 70% of the cost. And as a primary care physician today, to manage those complex patients, you need to be familiar with 40 different medications in 10 different drug classes. Uh, good Lord, I, I would have a hard time doing that today if I went back into primary care. And so what we're doing is providing virtual endocrinology guidance, almost like specialists uh, in their back pocket and feeding that information to them in terms of a treatment plan. Uh, we don't want to disintermediate primary care. We want to give them information and give them a chance to make those changes with their patients. Um, that being said, I can see some primary care providers, and I had colleagues that were like this, that would feel threatened by another entity, another physician coming in and making suggestions. They're very territorial. So um, I think many will embrace it and be grateful for that guidance and that help. I think some will push back. Uh, our intention is to be part of the team without being the patient center medical home. We still are gonna rely on the primary care provider to be the physician daily of record. Just help them out. That's what we're looking to do. Go ahead, Gretchen, chime in. I, I can just tell you from the provider perspective and as a person who manages a team of providers, most more often than not, providers are, PCPs are excited to hear from us um, when we do provide that outreach and maybe have a recommendation for insulin titration to keep their patients safe. Um, they're just excited to hear that their patient has a diabetes expert working with them um, because so few people actually take advantage of diabetes self-management and education after they have that diagnosis. So um, overall, seems to be really positive from what I've seen. Yep. So I'm curious, you know, okay, so we talked about like the cracks in the model, like, like talk, let's talk about care model here, right? So Thaj, I'm coming to you here because I'm curious about some of the cracks in the model that you discussed and some of the places where the model's still working. So when we look at though those cracks, when you're hearing all of this or what you're hearing from the providers and the plans that you're working with, you know, do, do they, are they looking at these virtual chronic care solutions as, as a way to fill in those cracks? And where do you think the expectation should really be? Like, is this really like the, like the silver bullet that's going to just make primary care, you know, thrive on all cylinders? Or is this something where it's like, we need to temper our expectations back? And if so, where? Well, I think, yeah, no, no question. We should probably temper our expectations, but we should still shoot for that silver bullet. Yeah. So let's hope it falls somewhere 
uh, somewhere in between. I mean, I think there's no question the clearest place in need, right, is thinking about longitudinal and ongoing care. Right? Even the primary care practice with the best intention built around a care team are reaching capacity challenges. And as new patient priorities come forward, you know, maintaining that ongoing specialized chronic care just falls out of what is realistic and probable out of a primary care uh, practice. So I do think you know, even things like I mentioned earlier around top of the license is probably a little bit uh, beyond what's realistic. Right? And what, what that means, I think we've, we've certainly worked with a lot of our clients to think about how others outside of the sphere of the primary care system, specialists and uh, solutions like chronic uh, care management solutions sort of fit into that longitudinal management of, of their patient. And I think it requires a comment that was made earlier, that communication back, right? And making sure that there's like, clear lines of communication of when a patient is being touched and by, by whom, right? I think the, the reality is, particularly for those patients that have a higher acuity of need, Right. While they look at their PCP, they certainly don't look at their PCP as their only provider. Right? If they're looking at multiple providers as kind of their, their team overall. And I think, you know, the question, of course, is how companies like Vita and 98.6, right, insert themselves seamlessly into a process where they're working with patients, but also with the PCP, the specialists, and, and sometimes the health plan, right, that are actually trying to do their own management, right? The worst case scenario is we're creating more confusion. The best case scenario and, and where we get closer to that silver bullet, Jeff, I think is where we're starting to find ways of working with patients based on their preference, right? And figuring out who is really the best person, who is the right team, what's the right platform that meets that patient uh, to how they actually sort of best manage their condition. I'm going to stop here for a quick second because our Q&A chat box is blowing up with some questions. So I'm going to take a couple of them that are topical right now. And the, the, the rest of those questions I see in their SCU, just give me a second. We're getting there, especially about data. Don't worry about that. But while we're talking about the model, I'm wondering, I want to, I want to hit up um, Alexandra Block's question about, pa about um, Patrick's point on equipping clinicians with the information to make decisions on their complex patient's care. So. The question here is, um, do we see that being overwhelming and too much work to manage, especially if they aren't quite fully value-based yet? Pat, what do you think about that? Is there too much to manage there? And is it, does it make a difference if um, it's not value-based yet? Um, I honestly don't think it's too much to manage. As a primary care provider, I would welcome the input from an endocrinologist when to use a SGLT2 or GLP-1 medication for a diabetic that has congestive heart failure or chronic kidney disease. I am not entirely familiar as a primary care provider necessarily about when and how to use those medications. So to get a virtual endocrine consult, which are really hard to get in the brick and mortar world, I would find hugely valuable. It would save me time and help me make the right decision for a patient. So I would look at it as an asset as opposed to a distraction or detriment in my practice. Okay, awesome. Brad, do you want to weigh in on that too, or should we ask another question from the crowd here? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. I think one of the things when I first came to 98.6 from uh, my previous work, I, I was very excited because I realized we would be building a platform where we would be observing interactions between doctors and patients and deciding how to build technology and impact care delivery. So the early years were built on using technology and the care delivery side. What we learned after a few years was we we're also build, building a large technical patient aggregation platform. Part of all of that comes back to how do you present the right data to the provider of record at the time, because there is massive amounts of data now, ultimately to drive the outcomes you're looking for, right? Which are uh, one of the early uh, aha moments I had when I was talking with the health system and they had a bunch of data on hypertension, but the physicians in the cohort that they were showing me were only practicing to the guidelines 16 to 18% on a given month. And so the question was, how do you support the healthcare providers driving higher levels of a positive outcome, which in that instance would be uh, directing patients and making sure that you know, ideally 100% of patients are being, the guidelines are being followed around hypertension man management as an example. How can we build technology and aggregate data and present data to the healthcare provider record that helps them make those decisions more efficiently and more effectively? 
Hey, Thais, I want to bring you into this here because I'm curious about about what we're hearing here from from Brad and Pat and and this whole idea of the digitization of chronic care, because I'm curious to know if like if that's like the real key here on it is the fact that this has become virtual. It's become, you know, something that's digitized. And as a result, it's increasing access. Like we heard Pat, like you couldn't get that in a brick and mortar situation. But, you know, now it's like it, things are virtual. They're a little bit more accessible. The convenience factor has risen. For, for patients and providers alike. And also, you know, it, what we always hear about digital is it helps reduce the cost. So I'm curious to hear what you think. Is this really, you know, the reason that we start that you think we might see an uptick in this integration of, you know, specialized chronic care into the primary care model is really based on the fact that it's digitized? Like how much of a factor is this omni-channel approach, do you think, to providers and payers and, and patients alike? Stage. Sorry, Jeff. Oh, there you um, go. I, I was like, did we lose it? <laughs> yeah, no, all good. All good. Um, I mean, I think it's the norm, right? This idea that uh, it, digital as an alternative platform, I think the word alternative is kind of going away, right? I mean, I think I think we can't look at digital care as somehow separate and distinct from, from physical care. I think we talked about the need for integration um, earlier. I think the ideal is the combination uh, of the two. And, and again, it's, it's about you know, I'll be a bit of a broken record on this, right? It's about sort of meeting that patient where they are, right? And identifying when's the right time to be physical and in person and when's the right time to use a digital platform, which clearly creates um, access. You know, MSK is an interesting example, right? You can imagine a, a patient with chronic uh, back pain. You see a company like PRN, which is a physical therapy company um, on the West Coast uh, that created a partnership with Bori Health, a, a virtual MSK pain management company. And now they're really giving sort of patients that opportunity to have some of their visits virtual and some of their visits in person. And there's that clear line of communication and coordination um, across the two, uh, across the two, right? And, and it's less of a choice of one versus another and more about how do you kind of work with both of those on an ongoing basis. Question coming to you real quick. I mean, we talked about payers, like how, how payers are thinking about this whole omni-channel thing. And I'm curious to, to, to get your perspective on this. You know, in the scheme of like adding a virtual chronic care solution into a primary care mix, I mean, what's the sentiment do you think around payers and how they're looking at this? Is this like cost additive or cost reducing? Like shiny new thing or like, oh God, not another thing, point solution. Uh, is it like, you know, this is something that's member engaging or member off-putting or does it does it depend on who the member is? I mean, what do you, what do you get a sense of from the payer perspective on this? Yeah, so in thinking about several of the payer populations that we've had at Vita, um, certainly, you know, when you think about your more um, like uh, Medicare level patients, um, it's definitely, there's cost benefit to it. And I think that patients see it that way too. Um, with those patients typically 65 and older, they're going to be more complex. Um, they have lots of barriers and, you know, they, um, they can quickly become overwhelmed with all of the specialists, special specialists that they need to see. And so I think one of the advantages of bringing them into a system, a digital solution where you have that specialty care, um, is that it reduces the overwhelm for them. It puts them at the center of care. Um, you have providers who are going to function as primary providers providers, use behavior change, uh, work with them on things like um, health literacy and numeracy challenges so that they can really understand what their what the impact of their condition is in the long term. Um, and kind of when you look at all of those different elements and integrate that into their care, then you can achieve that long-term behavior change. So, um, and, and then of course, we've seen that in other types of payer populations, younger payer populations. Um, I, you know, overall, I think people are excited about it as a new solution. Um, they're eager to embrace it. They love the idea of meeting with a provider one-on-one. -on -one. It's convenient, it's accessible. They don't have to get in their car and go somewhere. They can meet with the provider or whenever they want to, uh, they build rapport and a trusting relationship with this person. So they're much more likely to open up and, and make those changes. So overall, I think there's, um, I mean, we see there's tons of benefit for cost, cost reduction. You know, the payers are interested in two things as they should be. It's improve quality and reduce costs. Uh, and part of that is access to care. That's why you're seeing payers actually becoming providers today or, or purchasing provider groups. They see the same challenges uh, that we've discussed, access to care, improving the quality while reducing the total cost of care. 
And so I, they are aligned if we can present models that particularly for the complex, expensive patients, we're providing access, improving the quality and reducing costs by these really valuable interventions. They're behind that. Sage, what would you add there? What's that? Yeah, I mean, I think you added, you asked really the right question, right? There's this trade-off going on right now. Is it cost additive or cost savings? Is it engaging or is it off-putting? And I think it's a little bit of everything, right, that you just you just uh, mentioned. And there, there's no question that there is a little bit of a fear that's out there, right? You hear it when I, when I talk to my clients around uh, sort of the fear of the shiny new object. Uh, that could certainly be out there. I think the latest number, there's something like 350,000 digital health apps that are available. About half of those are are on a, on a single condition. And my guess is for the payers that are listening to this webinar right now, um, they probably feel like they've been approached by every single one of those companies. Uh, and so it's a little bit of sort of navigating uh, those waters, right? And trying to figure out um, who is someone that's bringing all of those capabilities that we've been talking about throughout our conversation uh, thus far. Because the reality is they're also looking at it at the same time saying their traditional PCP models, PCP-based models like PCMHs and ACOs, uh, in many ways they've plateaued in terms of what they've been able to do. They're, you kind of reach a certain scale and stage of, of even capability. And so they're looking for additional um, solutions, right, of potentially maybe even attributing risk, financial risk, not only to the PCV, but to others uh, as well uh, that have proven outcomes, cost savings, ability to, you know, really engage a member on an ongoing basis, drive some of those quality outcomes that Patrick was just uh, describing. And, and I think for those that are bringing those kinds of solutions, like the folks that are here on the call with me today, right, it's about bringing evidence of that effectiveness and how it actually applies into the local uh, market, right? If you're talking about a commercial population, it's a different discussion than it is for a Medicaid or a Medicare Advantage population. And and being able to speak to those nuances of how a payer can partner with that uh, organization and how the financial risk sort of comes along a journey um, is probably equally valuable as much as it is to just come in and say, we've got the answer figured out. Brad, I heard you want to chime in before. Go for it. Sorry. Thanks. Uh... No problem. Um, yeah, I think the other component is this notion that um, if we can increase engagement, and I think digital engagement is the first opportunity to increase engagement while actually potentially lowering the total cost of care of a patient, that that's an opportunity we need to take very seriously. I mean, why do 70% of uh, U.S. Uh, healthcare um, recipients start their healthcare journey on a search engine? Because it's on demand and it's free. And so we have, we, and, and that is a, a really astounding number, right? Like that's where people are going to get their initial information. We have to create digital tools that have increased value while leveraging that engagement model that we've seen work in other types of industries. So people, when they have questions, when they have a question about their own healthcare, that you have the opportunity through digital tools, synchronously or asynchronously to engage them in the moment to ultimately drive better outcomes and lower the total cost of care. All right, guys, I want to pivot to the data part of this conversation. And Julia Penberg, this is your big moment. So we're, we're going to ask that question out of the chat. So I want to want to kind of put this in context. And I think, you know, maybe, um, Pat, if you want to, to, to dive in on this one first, and you guys can, the rest of you can please chime in. You know, when it comes to the data that's coming in on this, and Brad made a great point at the very beginning about how overburdened technology has sometimes made primary care physicians. I mean, all physicians all along, you know, hate clicking into that EMR. But, you know, so what do you do now when there's so much different data coming in and to, to Julia's question here, there's so much disparate data points out there. How do providers manage all of this info coming in? Pat, do you have a good answer for that? <laughs> um, so what we're trying to do at, at Vita Health, and I think we by and large accomplish this, is to really give providers actionable data on these treatment plans. What specific medications need to be adjusted? Um, here's a summary of your patient's uh, continued glucose monitoring results. Here is a summary of the virtual uh, blood pressure results we're getting. And to really uh, make it very succinct um, and give them actionable data points without overwhelming them. Um, and that's our focus at Vita Health. Um, you know, the documents that Gretchen gets together with her team in terms of a care summary and with recommendations are very pointed and will tell them exactly what our view is. So I think it, it, my sense as a primary care provider, I wouldn't look at that as overwhelming. The other piece of data that we actually get is we get a full view of the patient's medication list through our short scripts feed on our EMR. 
which is very valuable for us to see what medications they're on. Um, it is overwhelming though for primary care providers. Let's be honest, the amount of information they get in as a PCP, what I wanted was actionable data. And I think that's what we strive for at Vita Health. And if I can add one more thing there too, um, is that one of the things that Vito does really well is we leverage machine learning and AI to give our providers that system support. So all of this data that, that Pat's talking about that we get, um, we're, we're able to really take all of that uh, and turn it into a specific recommend, hey, reach out to this person, their A1C went up, or hey, there's, they're a, they haven't had an A1C in three months. Um, and so we're able to deliver the right care at the right time, and it just optimizes uh, outcomes as well. Brad, chime in here real quick and kind of connect the dots all the way through to like, okay, so you're getting all this pointed data. How is that helping if you're in a primary care type situation that's more value-based? Well, I think that for, for many of the disease processes that we're dealing with, with these polychronic patients, we have national guidelines from a variety of subspecialty services that are telling us what is the most optimal way, as far as we know, as an organization, how to, how to deliver high quality care in the United States, whether that's, you know, antibiotic recommendations or, you know, diabetes recommendations, hypertension guidelines, all that. The question is, um, how do, how do we get the largest cohort of patients to essentially engage in their healthcare and drive those outcomes. So it's not only about patient engagement, but it, it involves provider engagement too, and provider assistance where you're grabbing that data and putting only the right information in front of the provider in that moment. You, I mean, you don't wanna like obscure the data, like you wanna give the provider the capacity to see all the data if there's questions they have, but there's too much data. So uh, using AI-based technologies to summate data, to present data to providers, to help them make decisions which they understand are consistent with recommendations and guidelines is a really important, something we've always lost in the quality side. In traditional healthcare quality management systems, they have virtual you know, quality guidelines that live on a, an electronic shelf, so to speak, and only come out when there's a bad outcome or a patient complaint or a quality management review. What you really need is a data system that's actually looking real time at all this and determining when quality is actually being achieved and when quality is not being achieved to inform better decision-making for providers down the road. All right, we've got about 20 minutes left or so. Keep your questions coming. I'm getting to them. Uh, we'll, we'll, again, we'll spend some, a few minutes at the end. And there are some that are very directed to folks who I think we can maybe email afterwards to address. But we are collecting these questions, so don't worry. So keep submitting them. I want to pivot now. I want to talk a little bit about outcomes. Because I think we spent a lot of time talking about what was wrong. We spent a lot of time talking about like how we could fix it. And then like, let's talk about what's actually going on right now. Because we've got the benefit of this expertise here that's uh, that's been working on this for for, uh, for a while now and have some good success stories that they want to share. So Gretchen, I think I want to start out with you. I mean, like you're, you're you, in your role. I mean, it sounds like you, you very much are on the front line in here. I'm curious about, you know, if could you share with us maybe a success story or some, some sort of like outcome story about where this marriage of, you know, virtual chronic care and prime care is like working out like give us give us a, a, a rosy picture of what's happening yeah um one of my favorite examples is about a member of ours and she's a very typical member uh, she's in her 70s she lives in a very rural part of our country um in texas she's 30 minutes from the closest grocery store she is uh very complex diabetes hypertension hyperlipidemia the conditions that you typically see as co-occurring um she also came in and because we screen for anxiety and depression uh she actually had depression clinical depression which was previously uh, undiagnosed. And so immediately we recognize this is a complex patient. She's got all these different social determinants of health impacting her ability to care for herself, low blood sugars, uh, problems with her medications, health numeracy issues, transportation issues. Um, she shops at a dollar store and that's actually very common in our country, um, especially in rural areas. Dollar stores are places where people get their primary food source from or food banks. Um, and so, you know, you kind of think about this in a context of prime in in the context of primary care if a patient like this were to go to a primary care physician in that 15 minute visit how on earth do you tackle all of these things right and and really help her to be successful um, but one of the things that i love about our story is we were able to bring in the right providers for her at the right time so we brought in a registered dietitian certified diabetes care and education specialist to help her with her insulin she was having low blood sugars which is really dangerous we matched her with a therapist so she was able to work on her depression 
medication um, in conjunction with that time she was spending with her dietitian. She saw pharmacists to help her, uh, you know, address some of those medication issues. Um, and then of course we can communicate this information directly to her PCP in her network outside of VITA. Um, and so overall, what we saw with this patient by taking this multi, um, uh, but this interdisciplinary approach, approach, I should say, but in one place, um, she had clinically significant A1C reduction, 72% uh, reduction in her depression. I think her A1C dropped by about two points. Um, she did things like walk around her trailer back and forth. And so that's an, idea, an example of meeting people where they're at. Um, and then we taught her how to make good food, food choices from, from the dollar store. Um, so overall, when you treat the physical and you treat the mental health together, you see greater outcomes, 33% um, greater reduction in A1C when you treat the two together. So um, yeah, that's a that's a success story that I love. And it's very common. Um, it's what we see a lot in, in our country and of course in our, our model at VITA as well. I'm getting some questions from the crowd here about who VITA and 98.6 are working with. And so I want to kind of go there for a second. And I want to, I want to, I'm going to do a little bit of question jujitsu here and combine one of my questions with some of the questions I'm getting in from the crowd here. So, so Michael Duffy, we've got asking about VITA and 98.6. If you guys are finding more interest or buy-in from provider groups or payer groups, like who's your target audience? Are you guys direct to consumer? So Brad Pat, as you guys are thinking about this question, keep that in the back of your mind. And then what I want to know is, depending on who you guys are working with here, you know, what are some of the ways that like, as somebody looks at like in your target audience, payer, provider, or direct, more payer, provider, right? Um, as you guys are looking at building out these models, you know, what should some of your clients think about in terms of KPIs or ways to establish a primary care plus virtual chronic care model in their, for their own populations? Brad, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, we actually started in the early years, um, 2015, back with a direct to consumer only product, just to kind of see how to, how to get the technology working. In a lot of ways, it's a really interesting place to start because uh, many of those patients don't have access to, uh, don't have an insurance plan. So when you're talking about care coordination and someone needs a cardiology referral in Des Moines in your Seattle based company, you know, how do you, so our, our care clinic operations team had to learn a lot in those early years. Uh, we, we've worked essentially now what we're, we're we're working with self-insured employers health plans and in the last year or two more directly with health systems to provide a digital front door solution that is specific and tailored to the needs of those organizations we have our own medical group that operates 24 7 on demand and so that supports uh, a lot of those clients in that way um, but certainly um, it's not only physicians now we have behavioral specialist coaches uh, clinic operations people like techs and um, nurses also operating on the platform as well. So it came a long way from the early years when you open the door and a doctor was always on the other side saying, how can I help you uh, to increase that value? So we're working with all those organizations, broadly speaking, in an effort to, because ultimately what we're interested in is uh, increased patient engagement in their healthcare and better healthcare outcomes. And that, how you get there really is a bit different if they're coming from the employer side uh, or versus a health plan or directly working with the health system. Because many patients in this country at the end of the day, most often affiliate with their health system brand. Their regional health system that's local, that's what they affiliate with. And so we've been working a lot more closely in that space in the last two years to understand how we can impact that space because at the end of the day, that's still, I think, where most patients see their care coming from as I'm a patient of X or a patient of Y health system in whatever city they, they're from. Yeah, so for Vita, we have two main customers. One is employers, really any size um, employer. And they will bring us in as kind of their chronic disease management platform. It may be for the whole suite of our services from mental health to cardiometabolic, or it may just be cardiometabolic. Uh, for payers, we have you know two large payer relationships and they again, choose what suite of services they wanna bring in. I would say that there's actually a convergence on what both payers and employers want. They wanna see return on investment. So I'm, if I'm at um, General Motors or if I'm at Boeing, and um, I'm paying a per member per month to a VITA or to a chronic disease management platform like VITA, I wanna see that actually my team members are improving, let's say with diabetes, their hemoglobin A1Cs are, are, are reduced. They're having less time out of work. There's a reduction in the number of visits to the emergency room or admissions to the hospitals. And really the payers are looking for the same thing. It's really ROI and improvement on quality. 
So I actually see them asking for the same thing. But in that space, I'd say employers more recently are looking for ROI. They're just not looking for a neat service to have. It's really, are you worth the money we're spending on you? Thanks. This is like a great moment to bring you in. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, talk to me yeah. about when you're consulting with a payer or an employer or a provider, like, and they're looking to build a, a primary care plus virtual chronic care solution. What should they think about? And are these KPIs right? Is it ROI? Like, prove it. Like, talk to us. Yeah. The, I, so I love the question because I think um, there is a lot of consistency. I think Patrick, to your point, around regardless of the constituent, right, that you're you're working with, they're asking for a lot of similar things, right? Referrals that are com that are converted into enrollment. The consistency of that engagement, right? Is it a one and done, or are they consistently using uh, the platform in terms of time and touch points and um, sort of repeats and those types of things? Obviously, things like what is their experience, right? What what are the satisfaction levels? Um, I think increasingly we're seeing you know, what's the impact that's happening on comorbid areas, right? So uh, again, recognizing that, you know, a single condition is very rarely the only thing that needs to be managed, right? There's obviously things that are happening, whether it's a social issue, whether it's another comorbid uh, uh, physical condition, whether it's a mental health condition, right? Understanding kind of the impact you're having outside of, I'll call it the immediate scope. There is that short list, right? We were talking earlier around uh, giving the PCPs a real sense of like specific actions, right? So how is how is the solution helping to close uh, any of those gaps? And, and Jess, if you're okay, I wouldn't mind asking Patrick a question on the last Absolutely. Like those are all, <laughs> yeah, like those are all leading up to ultimately at the end of the day, the, the biggest question, as we said earlier, was the ROI, right? And they're looking for what that return is. But I think there's more recognition happening that you can't look at it, right, under a one or two year timeline. Right. Beyond that, it's, it's once you start getting these really short time frames of, hey, I got six months, let me see the return. That's when it starts getting really challenging. Right. And, and I think we've seen a lot of our vendor partners, you know, struggle with showing that because the reality is like these are things that just have a, a duration of time. So I'd love to, to learn a little bit about how Vita and 96 are kind of mm -hmm. thinking about how to sort of talk through the time required right, to demonstrate that value. Thanks, we should have made you put that chat, that question in the chat, just like everybody else, to keep it fair. <laughs> yeah. I hogged it. <laughs> I absolutely agree. We are challenged with, um, if, if you're demanding that you see an ROI in one year, um, that's really tough, particularly for the lower acuity members. Um, so we, we try to frame our contracts, particularly with employers, over you know a three, maybe even a four year time interval because we're absolutely convinced we can make an impact. We're absolutely we convinced we can engage more patients, uh, more of their team members uh, to, to better their care. But it's really hard to turn that around in, in one year. And so that's the tension when you go in to negotiate these contracts is what time frame are we looking at? Grant, I think you were asked this question too. <laughs> No, I, mean, I agree with what Pat said. And I think one of the things we've tried to do is because we're taking care of patients, they can come in for a simple question, their acute care medicine needs or chronic disease. We have an opportunity to more broadly impact the patient, but it's the same, the same uh, issues apply, which is it kind of depends on who your partner is and what the metrics are they're interested in looking at. One of the areas that we try and focus on in the short term is around engagement. We fully believe in 90.6 that increased engagement is going to lead to better outcomes. So if we're working with an employer's example, we can get your engagement up from the 0.5 to 1%, the tip, typical anal, video analog telemedicine can do, and we can get you up to 25 to 40% engagement with your employer population. It, it, HR benefit plan mem, uh, owners, people in the plan space understand that that engagement is likely to lead to very good outcomes, even if it's hard to demonstrate in the first three months. Like if you're actively able to engage people in their healthcare, that's the first step for everything else. So. We sort of gate that at the front end of saying, look, if we can get you from your 1% you are right now in a year to 20%, will you find that to be value? And generally self-insured employers are answer yes. Like we would, we would welcome that increased engagement to see what happens after that. And so that's been a benefit to us um, to sort of bridge that short-term gap where you're not gonna be able to show some of the long-term outcomes demonstrably in like even two years really. 
All right, I'm gonna do a last minute question jujitsu here, but last call for questions. We may not get to it live, but I mean, again, we are answering questions on email after this. So please submit them if you got them. I wanna ask real quick and then I'm gonna do a lightning round wrap up question, okay? So last question from the audience is this, asking about digital. So Liz Kiefer, I'm gonna say that's how your last name is, is pronounced and I hope I didn't butcher it, but um, asking about the panel's experience with engaging patients in a digital space. So what's worked well from, in terms of transitioning care from in-person to virtual, to telehealth, to remote patient monitoring, especially for older populations? Also, I saw questions about SDOH earlier and also any particular conditions that might work best. So I'm gonna like bundle this together here. Give us some advice. Like what are your learnings for, you know, for helping people go from this like in-person to virtual space or to, to deal with a virtual only type of solution? Gretchen, I see you nodding. You want to go first real quick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can say at Vita, we do what's called surround sound marketing. And so it's really omni-channel. We're going to work with our employers. We're going to work with the payers. We're going to figure out what the best way is to reach their population. It may include email. It may include flyers, other marketing materials, webinars. So there's a whole variety of ways that we can do that. We can target it to that population. Um, we also have what's called a service center. And so those people provide outreach to patients to get them rolled. They are there specifically for that purpose. Um, um, and what we find a lot of the times is once you get them in there and they, especially in the older populations, people are wary, right? They don't, uh, they're very concerned about their privacy. Um, they don't know how the technology works. So once you can help people understand, no, we're real humans, we're not robots. You're going to be working with someone one-on-one. -on -one. You have a long-term relationship with them. Um, it's much easier to get them engaged. Um, it's worked for us. We've seen really um, high engagement in our model, six months, we still see 70% of our patients are engaged synchronously and asynchronously. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of that is really that personalized one-on-one -on -one care that, that we invest in our patients. Anybody else want to chime in on the, the, the transfer from in-person to digital, digital back to in-person? Yeah, I'll just okay. say really quickly, Jeff, I think, uh, two, two things, two things really quickly. One, um, you know, it's really interesting. I think uh, increasingly, the assumption that, um, you know, the older population actually is not tech savvy is, is increasingly not being true, right? And you look at 65 to 80 year olds, they're incredibly tech, uh, tech savvy and, and perfectly capable um, of getting onto some of these solutions. The other thing I was going to mention, though, was um, it's all about, I think, as Gretchen was describing a bit, um, how that referral is made on the front end, right? How are they educated about what it is? How do they get to it? And in some cases, we've seen this particularly even in Medicaid populations. Um, which would probably be true for the older populations as well, is, is sometimes you need that physical location in order to access the digital platform, right? FQHCs, for example, can provide a really interesting uh, place of service, even if the interaction is happening virtually or digitally. All right, guys, last question for you. Lightning round question here. All right, so this whole idea of specialized virtual chronic care blending into that primary care model, what does this set us up for in terms of the future of value-based care? Lightning round. How do you see this playing round? Uh, Gretchen, let's start with you. Uh, okay, so I have to be quick here, but I think, you know, essentially this perception that specialized care is complex and it's only accessible to people with really good health insurance, uh, I think has been one of the challenges. And so one of the ways that I see the digital solution really coming into play there and integrating with, with primary care models is by showing that you can have these specialty solutions all in one place. We can work with the existing networks and benefits ecosystems uh, just to really optimize that patient care, put the patient at the center and build everything else around around them. Hey, Thage, what would you say? Last words on that. Like, how does this set us up for the future of like an at-risk value-based kind of model? Yeah, it's all super positive. I think you've got innovators like Vita and 98.6 that are here uh, today that are, they're filling holes, right? There are gaps in the system. There's a need to expand and extend uh, in working in collaborative ways. All of that drives to better outcomes, both in terms of quality and, and economics. Uh, I think we've talked a lot about sort of the, the opportunity to stair step, jump in terms of what those outcomes look like. Uh, and it's a matter of sort of connecting the dots and making sure there's the right handoffs uh, in between all these players. Because we're introducing new players in as long as there's good communication and transfer of information. Um, a lot of real great opportunity here. All right, Brad, what do you think? You know, how does this set us up for a, uh, set us up for more value based models in the future? I, I'm super excited about this as the long-term benefit for digital healthcare. I mean, essentially, we're for the first time in the room. We're with the patient a lot, and we, in some ways, with all the digital connected tools we can have. With we understand what the patient's doing in their life, what their mobility data is, what their cost data is. 
and all and the, the integration with mobile experience allows us even a bigger data set to understand what actually impacts value-based care. So that's very exciting to me. The other thing is that seeing more companies finally realize that you know half of your engineers should be working on provider-facing technology. You can't put a bunch of technology in front of, in front of providers that isn't focused on the provider experience and expect that to actually impact value-based care and outcomes because you need the provider workforce to enjoy and leverage those digital tools to get the clinical outcomes you're looking for. I love that. Enjoy and leverage. Like It's not just enough to leverage it. We got to enjoy it too, because we know what happens when they don't. <laughs> all right, Pat, wrap this up for us. I mean, paint the picture, connect all those dots. So, you know, how does this, this blended model of cr virtual chronic care fitting into primary care lead us into more of a value-based type model? Yeah, I think what we're looking at, this is healthcare. It's not digital versus brick and mortar. Um, the model that's going to win in the future because it's going to provide better quality and better access is the hybrid model that's using digital health assets like 98.6, what Vita Health can do on the chronic cardiometabolic and mental health conditions, but also marrying that to the brick and mortar care because there are some things you just need that in-person care and that patient center medical home for. So I look at it as the model of the future. It's been a little rocky getting there, but we are going to get there and it's going to show more value in the longer run. All right. Well, let's leave that there. I want to thank our very, very engaged audience um, for submitting all of their questions. I mean, I think I might steal some of these for future interviews. Thanks, guys. Um, no, thank you. And to our panelists for rolling with a lot of those questions and for answering all of mine. So thank you guys so much. They scratch and Pat, Brad, it's been a pleasure to speak with you guys here. And thanks so, again to Health for hosting us. Pleasure to be part of this Health Go Live series. Uh, if you guys need any more information, again, we were going to answer those questions out of the chat. You'll be reached out to, I promise. And if you're looking for a recording of this i think it will be available later on health site thanks thank, thank you so much yeah thank you to jessica and all of our speakers please visit our website at hlth.com to catch up on all health go live webinars and join us in las vegas november 13th through 16th for health 2022